while it has long been neglected, the theme of religion and humanitarianism is actually a really important theme. In fact, from uh, uh, our personal experience in both uh, research and professional um, activities, we, we think you can't properly have a, uh, an understanding of humanitarianism without attention to religion. Uh, it, it is that central to understanding the way it works on the ground. Um, the first slide you can see now is of a book by Michael Barnett called Empire of Humanity. and It's a very recent book. Michael Barnett's argument is quite simply that the history of humanitarianism is grounded in religious origins. Uh, he argues that humanitarianism, that, that the Big Bang of humanitarianism was the evangelical revivals in Europe in the 19th century. Uh, he says that these uh, missionary ideals were really grounded um, in, in a desire to, to save distant others. Uh, the, these, the evangelicalism helped found the organizational uh, infrastructure, civil society, which humanitarianism now relies upon. Uh, and, and in fact, the whole history of Western humanitarianism is grounded in these religious origins, to which it continues to owe a profound debt. Uh, Barnett argues that over time there has been a, a secularizing process. Uh, these religious roots have been ne neglected and, 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 and pushed to one side. Uh, God, he says, has been replaced with uh, uh, an appeal to the notion of humanity and to also technical expertise. However, it remains true that many of the largest NGOs today are, are, are religious organizations. Uh, and, and in fact, it continues to permeate uh, much of the humanitarian industry. Um, this said, Western Christianity and uh, Western history are not the only histories and, and religions that matter when it comes to talking about humanitarianism. Uh, there are, in fact, many other traditions, and these two uh, are extremely important. So what we'd like to do now is give you a case study of the, one of the largest social welfare organizations in Asia. This is an Indonesian Muslim organization called Muhammadiyah. Muhammadiyah was established in 1912 uh, as part of the modernist reformist move that was, uh, that was taking place across the entire Islamic world at the turn of the century. Muhammadiyah has over 25 million members that are spread throughout the country of Indonesia. Uh, it also has an infrastructure and a network that goes throughout the country at every level of government, provincial, uh, capital, provincial, district, and sub-district. So it has over 11,000 branch offices throughout the country. Muhammadiyah's primary objective is da'wah, which is improving the understanding and the practice of Islam for believers. But a secondary mission, and a very important one, is social welfare. So Muhammadiyah runs over 450 hospitals and clinics. Uh, over 10,000 schools, 174 universities throughout the country. Now when the Aceh tsunami took place, happened in, uh, in, in 2004, Muhammadiyah was there on the ground, active and mobilized in the communities where the, the worst disaster took place. So at a time when international aid agencies were scrambling to find satellite phones, try to figure out which roads were still passable, which bridges were down, Muhammadiyah was there with a chain of command, with an infrastructure easily uh, mobilized. So that experience and uh, their experience, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, of, of how they were able to respond to the tsunami, helped them realize that they could be uh, an important player and contributor to humanitarian disaster response. They then went on to respond to the Jogja and Sumatra earthquakes and to the Mount Merapi volcano eruption in 2010. Over these years, they've gradually professionalized, they gradually institutionalized, and in 2010, they formed MDMC, the Muhammadiyah Disaster Management Center, um, to be able to respond more professionally. So what I'd like to do now is to go through these four categories that you see on the slide of partner institutions. These are the, the, the categories of the organizations that Muhammadiyah responds with and it partners with in disaster response. And I want to show you the range of activities and the range of partners, but also how religion does or does not feature in, in Muhammadiyah's response. So the first category that I want to talk about is the international NGOs. Um, you can see the range of organizations there. Uh, these are all secular NGOs. And many of them, in their partnership with Muhammadiyah, 
responded in support of existing Muhammadiyah institutions. So you see, Give to Asia funded Muhammadiyah medical teams from Java to go to Aceh. Mercy Relief uh, adopted a Muhammadiyah school uh, in Malabo, reconstructed it, built it, it supported Muhammadiyah orphanages. So they support existing Muhammadiyah infrastructure and, and institutions. In the second category, the next slide, the faith-based organizations, you see on the slide the range of, of organizations that Muhammadiyah faith, uh, partners with, the range of faiths that are represented here, um, and the types of partnerships and the types of activities that they, they carried out together. In the first example, um, the, um, the Youth Off the Street in Australia, this is a, a non-denominational organization founded by a Catholic priest. And they went into Aceh after the tsunami and they saw the, the immense need, immediate need for orphanages. Um, now this was a very politically sensitive issue, this Christian organization wanted to set up orphanages. There were lots of rumors, lots of concerns uh, about Christianization in the wake of the, of the tsunami. Uh, Muhammadiyah, with his experience of running 300 orphanages across the country, and with its political clout, its religious authority, was able to mediate those sensitivities and able to partner effectively with this Christian organization to, uh, to, to run orphanages. So that's just one example of how Muhammadiyah can partner with other faiths and other faith-based organizations. The third category we want to talk about is foreign governments. Uh, you see there the list of foreign governments that have supported Muhammadiyah's work in Indonesia. AusAid is MDMC's largest and longest lasting partner. It helped to establish MDMC. Uh, it, it provided training and funding, helping MDMC to professionalize over the years. Uh, Muhammadiyah and MDMC was the first local organization that, Muhammad, that AUSAID ever provided direct grants to uh, in Indonesia. Now for the foreign governments and for the next category, on the next slide you can see, uh, which is the UN and multilateral partners. Um, in both of these instances, the type of partnership is primarily the provision of logistics and large-scale aid, materials, um, food, water, hygiene kits, in the immediate aftermath of a disaster which then were distributed by Muhammadiyah. Uh, so you have IOM bringing in tons and tons of food and, and supplies, but no infrastructure on the ground. Uh, Muhammadiyah present on the ground, thousands of volunteers available, and, 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 and logistics and supplies available to be distributed on the ground. So this was the kind of partnership that took place primarily with the foreign governments and with the UN multilateral agencies. So in, the, in conclusion, and our um, next to the last slide here, you see here a, a list of some of the lessons learned. Now these are lessons learned taken not just from the Muhammadiyah case, <coughs> but also from our research and, um, and shared stories of humanitarian responder, responders across the globe. Religious organizations are, as, you've, as we know, often used uh, for distribution of goods, as I just talked about. Um, They've got a chain of command, a hierarchy in place on the ground, easily mobilizable. They've got funds that are easily liquidatable in an emergency. They've got foot soldiers, as it were, They're ready to be deployed. In the case of Aceh, Muhammadiyah was definitely first on the ground um, and, and ready to go. In terms of um, cultural appropriateness and, um, and their political and religious authority, these religious organizations um, are able to mediate sensitivities, are able, able to negotiate some of the political concerns that take place when international aid agencies are working in politically sensitive areas. Um, and as we know, recovery uh, often includes psychosocial dimensions, which religious organizations are also poised to deliver on. The image you can see on this slide is really quite extraordinary. It's an image of Masjid Rahmatullah, an, an Islamic mosque in the village of Lumbuk in uh, Aceh after the tsunami. And as you can see, it, the area was absolutely devastated by the tsunami. And the one building standing is this mosque. Indeed, after the tsunami, many stories have been spread and, 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 and went around about how when the waves came in, people ran to the mosque and clung onto it or climbed onto the roof and, and were literally saved from a watery death as a result. Here you have religion not just as an ideological force or a cultural force, but also as a very physical aspect of the landscape and offering extremely tangible uh, resources that people then can use in times of disaster. The final slide we want to show is uh, of a book 
published in 2003 by Greg Bankoff called Cultures of Disaster. In the book, Greg talks about uh, the various statistics related to disaster around the world. He, he says um, that 93% of natural hazards take place in what's often called as the developing world. Uh, up to 96 to as much as 99% of casualties as a consequence of natural disasters also take place in the develop developing world. For Bankoff, this raises a number of very important questions. In particular, he asks, uh, and, and, and the quote up there indicates it, let me just read it out so you've got it. For billions of people, in fact, for the greater part of, the, of humanity, hazard and disaster are simply just accepted aspects of daily life. So normal, in fact, that their cultures are partly the product of adaptation to these phenomena. Cultures of disaster are cultures around the developing world that have been produced through interaction with disastrous experiences. For our own frame of looking at religion and humanitarianism, this raises a question, can we ask about religions of disaster? Have the religions in much of the A Asian region been produced at least in part through the experience of, of disaster? Um, if so, in what ways? Um, but also comes a question, what resources do religions around Asia bring to the task of disaster relief? How might humanitarian organizations interact with religious communities around the region in ways that help support these resources rather than undermining or undercutting them? This is a last thought that we'd like to leave it on. Um, can we talk about religions of disaster? What resources do religions around Asia bring to the task of humanitarianism?